Welcome to all of you for joining us from around the globe for this very special moment for the American Educational Research Association and for the entire field of education research. On the screen next to me, you can see the program for this event. We are thrilled to be here today to recognize Dr. Edmund W. Gordon's countless contributions to scholarship, society, and the individual lives of so many by installing him as the first ever AERA honorary president. I myself have benefited from working with Dr. Gordon for almost 20 years, and I am thrilled, absolutely thrilled, to have the opportunity to serve in just a little while as his executive director. And I am now pleased to turn to my dear friend and colleague, Dr. Kenji Okuda, for comments and a conversation with Dr. Gordon. Good afternoon. Um, this is a, uh, a once in a century event and, uh, and partly recognizing the, uh, the, uh, the importance of this occasion. Uh, I actually uh, wrote down what I wanted to say and, and I'll read because I, I, I really wanted to make sure that I got every word that I wanted to say uh, in. So this is a conversation, but I have quite a few things I want to share, and then Ed will, re, uh, will respond and reflect to that. But Ed and uh, Professor Gordon, uh, I'm delighted to say a few words about you and about the significance of your accomplishments in your centennial year, as AERA recognizes and bestows the unique title, Honorary President, upon you. First of all, I want to personally thank you for your friendship over the years. We first met in the psychology department at Yale in 1979. I was a freshly minted assistant professor and you were a senior faculty member and endowed chair holder. You were an intimidating yet disarming presence. You became an important role model to me. You set the tone of a psychology department that included a tolerance for forays into education, not that common then or not even today. Without your influence, I probably would have remained within the conservative confines of academic psycholinguistics, studying something like the cognitive processes underlying the relative clause structure of different languages. But over the years, you kept inviting me uh, sorry about that. My phone went off. Um, he kept inviting me to join you on some of your many adventures as a psychologist into the world of educational practice and policy. I hope that I've lived up to whatever you saw in me when we first met. I did not appreciate then, but through our more recent reflective conversations have come to know the way that Edmund W. Gordon came to be how you became the great champion of equal educational opportunity. I knew through your passing references about the influences that W.E.B. Du Bois had on you. This centennial has been a way for me to learn more about you. You were born on June 13th, 1921, <clears throat> just as America was emerging from the last great pandemic. Poetically, we celebrate your 100th birthday as the world finds itself on the heels of another major viral outbreak. You shared with me that your father, a Jamaican-born doctor settling in Goldsboro, North Carolina, treated patients suffering from the Spanish flu, which buffered your family from much of the economic pain of the Great Depression that soon followed. Growing up under these privileged circumstances, you internalized your father's values quote, that people who are privileged have responsibilities for helping less privileged people. You also remember that your father kept a copy of Du Bois's The Souls of Black Folk prominently displayed on his bookshelf and that he gave you a copy of Black Reconstruction as you headed off to college at Howard. Through your remarkable life, you've developed and practiced a distinctive version of moral scholarship. Influenced by your father, 
and years later, through your acquaintances with historic figures that included Alan Locke, Doxy Wilkinson, Kenneth Clark, and the artist Charles White, and of course, Du Bois. You were drawn to and attracted to a growing dynamic set of influencers and influences. You also shared with me the fact that your early transition from your study of Christian, Christian theology, as you lost your traditional belief in Christianity to embrace agnosticism and humanism, mentored by Howard Thurman, professor of theology and dean of the chapel at Howard University. One of the things that you've told me about Du Bois, the scholar, was what you called his deontic perspective, a philosophical approach that requires taking into account context and varying perspectives, not just the knowledge itself. What you so eloquently stated in terms of what you learned from Du Bois was as follows. And I'll quote, the official knowledge base was not sufficient for this intellectual giant. He insisted on understanding the context out of which the knowledge was developed and in which it must be understood. He distinguished between knowing and understanding. Understanding requires that we know the phenomenon from the different contexts and perspectives that give the phenomenon meaning. Du Bois teaches us that such perspective sometimes challenges the validity of the official knowledge. The arc of time represented in the past 100 years is complex. Uh, you could list the depths emerging from the depths of Jim Crow through major world wars, the school desegregation and civil rights struggles, an emerging federal role in education, a theoretical shift from behaviorism to cognitivism and situated learning, conflicts over globalism and tri tribalism, including Trumpism, recognition of the many facets of racism and xenophobia, efforts to attain educational equity through standards, assessment, and accountability systems, increasing economic inequality, and the influence of technology. What your centennial affords us is an understanding of how the academy, the nature of knowledge, the producers of knowledge, and the potential beneficiaries of the knowledge has grappled with important societal issues, including but not limited to the problem of the color line within which the paradigmatic societal changes over the century. <clears throat> Great scholars of color from prior generations, such as Du Bois, and we would add to that the biologist Charles Turner, whose unrecognized work on animal cognition was recently celebrated in the journal Science. These trailblazing academics were structurally deprived of teaching in institutions that attracted a next generation of talented scholars. And their accomplishments were diminished by the mainstream as so well argued in the case of Du Bois by Alden Morris in his book, The Scholar Denied. These early scholars were denied the opportunity to mentor. You were of a time when the barriers were starting to come down and you held endowed professorships at Columbia University and at Yale University. Through these pulpits, you were able to attract and mentor a remarkable collection of younger scholars and advocates and you've succeeded in passing along the values that your father instilled in you about the responsibilities that the more fortunate have to take care of others. You have highlighted and celebrated an intergenerational model of the development of scholarship. What a remarkable legacy you've left us in following in your footsteps. So Professor Gordon, I thank you for your wisdom rooted in your values, as well as your generosity. You are one heck of a human being. You presented humanity with a true and precious gift, one based on caring and decency in addition to understanding. As we agreed in the planning of this presentation, I would like to close by reading two statements that you recently made that capture succinctly your ongoing mission going forward. So this is quoting you. One, 
I've tried to reconceptualize a widely accepted notion concerning equality of educational opportunity. Some of my students and I believe that given the state of educational development for the diverse population of students in the US, the pursuit of equity and opportunities is more appropriate than the pursuit of equality defined as sameness. We also believe that equity will require that we take advantage of recent findings concerning the nature of human learning that move us away from teaching and learning as a transmission of knowledge and technique toward learning as the enablement of learners to orchestrate and mediate their own learning. In the words of William Butler Yeats, education is not the filling of a pail, but the lighting of a fire. Over the last few years, this is your second point, over the last few years, I've invested much of my energy in trying to repurpose educational assessment to better serve learning and teaching. This reflects the major finding that came from the Gordon Commission on the Future of Assessment for Education in contrast to assessment of education. This group that I led advanced the notion that educational assessment can and should inform and improve learning and its teaching, as well as measure developed ability. As Wade Boykin has argued, the system of educational assessment should privilege the development of ability as much as it has promoted the measurement of ability. Your gift is not just in articulating these important lines of thinking and scholarship, but in continually reminding us of our intergenerational connectedness and of our broad obligation to mentor and nurture the field. So thank you, Ed, Professor Gordon. And now I'd like to invite you to say a few words. Thank you, Kenji. Thanks, dear friend. Folks, as you go through life, you have to watch what you're saying and what you're doing and particularly with whom you're hanging out. I didn't even know this new dude noticed me in those first years at Yale, but he was studying me and adopting me, I guess, as a mentor. Thank you, thank you very much. After such a thoughtful statement, I hardly feel the need to say much more, and I won't. I think uh, we ended, uh, that is Kenji did, on two notes that you're likely to hear more from me concerning. I don't know what an honorary president uh, does. I'm enormously proud, pleased, moved that AERA has designated me such. Some of you may not know it, but I tried to get this position, the real one, they elected to this position three different times. And each time I was not elected to have your leadership decide to give me the title here in my last years is a great privilege for me. And if my health maintains itself, which I've got all the indications that it will, I'm going to be an active honorary president, because I'm going to be pushing my agenda. I believe that as good as measurement science has become, we need to use it to educate students as much as to measure their education. We've got a little group going now, it calls itself a, a seminar on assessment, educational assessment in the service of learning. Educational measurement, I believe, ought to serve learning. You'll hear more and more and more of that from me. Number two, uh, Kenji made this point also. I think we got it wrong back in uh, 54 with the su Supreme Court decision the ruling that the state cannot constitutionally segregate its students is right on target. It was a good thing for our society. 
I think it was a bad thing for education because it took our, us educators' eyes off the processes of pedagogy. It took us on the mixing people and uh, trying to uh, better distribute resources. I think we need to return to the problems of teaching and learning. And when people differ, when people come from different backgrounds, different uh, cultures, different uh, appreciations, the education for them needs to be differential, needs to be different, needs to be customized. You're going to hear those two me messages from me. Maybe so much that you get tired, so tired that you unseat me. I hope not. Thank you again. Thank you, Kenji. Thank you, friends. And yeah. Ed, I wanted to just add that um, another way that the field will hear from you are through the series of events that we have planned over the next year. Uh, on June 2nd and 3rd, there will be a conference at Teachers College uh, honoring, uh, on, honoring you and these lines of work that you've started uh, that, um, um, that you'll be hearing about. And there's a series of, of events that other institutions will be, will be having. And uh, please go to the Teachers College uh, website and look for uh, the Gordon-Centennial uh, link there, and you'll see uh, details about the conference as well as uh, other events planned for this year. So we have cer certainly not the heard heard the last from uh, for, from Professor Gordon, and we really 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 look forward to this year. I didn't want to pr promote that centennial, but it's great. Yes, it's a big I party. Hope, I hope it will be remembered not so much for my 100 years as for the ideas that it points to for future work. I think we've got to really go to work on equalizing our, on the achievement of equity in education. That requires customization, differentiation, adequate sufficiency. And I hope I live long enough for my friends and measurement to turn the corner and start devoting some of our resources to educating kids, there's always time to measure them. Thank you. Back yeah. to you, Felice. Well, thank you. Thank you both. And uh, you could be sure, Dr. Gordon, we have no intention of um, uh, taking back this uh, honor and it will be an honor for all of us to serve with you in your term as honorary president. And I want to turn this over to our uh, group of uh, past presidents um, in order of their service, a select number, calling upon four of our past presidents to welcome Dr. Gordon, starting with Dr. Linda Darling-Hammond, to the august community of ARA past presidents, Dr. Darlingham. Ed, uh, it is so great to see you. Uh, I'm looking forward to many more occasions this year, and I want to welcome you to the group of AERA presidents, uh, first by appreciating how much we have all learned from you. You have been a teacher, not only of students, but of faculty, of researchers, of policymakers over many years. Um, You've led the field, and many would say that you've been ahead of your time, uh, and maybe we're catching up at this point. Um, the work that you've done on uh, diversity in learning uh, and what it implies for teaching and assessment is now, of course, the, uh, what neuroscience is confirming, that uh, the myth of average, that no two human brains are alike, that we are all unique, and that uh, the goal of our learning has to be a living into that uh, potential is an idea you've been putting forward for I don't know how many decades I first heard it from you at Teachers College more than 30 years ago. Uh, I just want to say I hope that you do have an opportunity to give us a presidential address this year. Um, and I would love for it to be on the work that you've been doing, the reconceptualized teach testing and assessment. 
um, so that it is educative and supportive of learning rather than reductive and punitive and a barrier to educational opportunity. Um, Ed, uh, as uh, we all know, has challenged the conventional wisdom, the status quo, and inequality in everything that he has done, but always with that calm demeanor, that little twinkle in the eye that makes people want to listen. Uh, one headline from an article about Ed captured it well. It said, always agitating, but never agitated. And I think that is uh, one of the things that personifies your leadership. I'll close with uh, the definition of leadership that Congressman Augustus Hawkins, the father of uh, Title I, once put forward, and I think it describes you. The leadership belongs not to the loudest, not to those who beat the drums or blow the trumpets, but to those who day in and day out in all seasons work for the practical realization of a better world, those who have the stamina to persist and to remain dedicated. Uh, Ed, you have always been that kind of leader, and I am thrilled to welcome you to AERA uh, presidency. Hello, Ed. Hello, Ed. I'm very pleased and honored to welcome you to uh, AERA as an honorary president. This honor is greatly deserved. By becoming an AERA honorary president, you enhance the pantheon of AERA presidents. In addition to being an eminent and visionary scholar, you are an amazing human being who is generous, encouraging, and a wonderful mentor and supporter of younger scholars. When I first became a professor, there were few African-American scholars on the faculties of prestigious universities who were models for excellence. I reached out to you on a visit to, teach, to, to Teachers College. You embraced and encouraged me and has been a model for me for my entire career. When I asked you to come to the University of Washington to give the inaugural lecture to open the Center for Multicultural Education in 1992, you said yes without hesitation. Even in retirement, you are a model for me. I'm still trying to become the scholar and human being that you have modeled and inspired. You epitomize excellence, diligence, and eloquence. By making you an honorary president, we have enriched the legacy of AERA presidency as well as the organization itself. Welcome to the presidency. Thank you very much, Jen. Thank you. Hi, Ed. This is Carol. I'm going to welcome you to this uh, group of former AERA presidents. Ed once mentioned to me that his one disappointment across his career was not having become an AERA president. But good things come to those who wait, right? <laughs> Uh, Ed has taken up the mantle of those who mentored him. Um, when he visited our school uh, in Chicago, he and his wife Susan some years ago, he was standing in an assembly with the children and he told them how W.E.B. Du Bois liked to go to movies in the afternoon. We were like, oh, wow, that's, that's not in any book, right? Uh, as Kenji had indicated, his mentors included giants like W.E.B. Du Bois, Alain Locke, Paul Robeson, Howard Thurman, not in theory, but these people were his good buddies and friends. And as a young man, he learned from them and he took up that mantle. And we have now what we call the Gordon School with major scholars from across the country who all see themselves as, as having been mentored and, and developed and, and promoted in our, in our growth and development by Ed Gordon. Even before his ascent in the academy, Ed and his wife, Susan, had established a clinic uh, in Harlem where they offered holistic supports uh, for children. And then many, many years later, when he went to teach at college and established the Institute for Urban and Minority Education, he made the radical decision to set up the offices uh, in Harlem. And I had a wonderful opportunity to visit there where you would see scholars, and community residents and practitioners all working together at that office uh, in Harlem. 
Uh, at the height of his career here, uh, he has written a three-volume intellectual memoir called Pedagogical Imagination, a conceptual memoir. And he took the bold move when he could have gone to any publisher in the world to come to Third World Press, the oldest Black publishing company that has continuously published really in the world. And in addition to that three volume memoir, which I would encourage everyone to read, he had also his most latest book on assessment, uh, human variance and assessment for learning that he brought again to this black publisher. Uh, he's maintained a longstanding relationship with Rock Community College, which is in the neighborhood uh, where he lives and in that work has mentored uh, countless high school and community uh, college students. Uh, and at 100, he's got a new book he's working on and several other big projects. He's doing more than most of us are doing. And finally, I would say that perhaps his greatest legacy are his children, who just as he stands on the shoulders of W.E.B. Du Bois, they stand on his shoulders in terms of academic excellence, deep moral grounding and commitment to community. Dr. Susan G. and Edmund Gordon's children established, and I never pronounce it correctly, the CGs, I'm sure I'm mispronouncing it, the Institute and Library to continue their parents' life work in the promotion of social justice, particularly as it pertains to health education and the environmental and material well being of marginalized community. They reflect both Ed and his wonderful wife, the late Susan Gart Gordon, who stood by him, who pushed and challenged him, his wonderful compliment. And just as one side story about the pushing, Ed has a, a pool in his in, in the house that I understand Susan insisted that he built, that he go in every day and swim and exercise. And I asked him, does he still do it? And he said, yes, he does. He's better than me. <laughs> Congratulations, Ed. Thank you, Carol. Thank you very much. Dear Dr. President Gordon, I am honored to be invited to speak on this historic occasion and I know that I'm joined by all our friends and colleagues here at Teachers College in congratulating you on this official recognition and long overdue title of AERA president. I want to thank President Sean Harper, Executive Director Felice Levine and the AERA Council for formalizing what has been informal for so long. Your leadership in the field of education, constantly pushing to transcend disciplinary boundaries, asking the questions that no one else has thought to ask, and mentoring your students and younger colleagues to live up to our highest potential has meant that you have been an inspirational leader within AERA for decades. Furthermore, two years ago, when I was president of AERA, you taught me how to use the mechanism of a consultative conversation with a diverse group of scholars to generate a broad and all-encompassing theme that would call on AERA members to make connections across divisions and SIGs to leverage our scholarship in the post-truth era. In these and so many other ways, you have been our AERA thought leader, our role model, and our visionary for so long. It is only fitting that today we bestow a formal title that acknowledges, honors, and celebrates you, and celebrates what we have accomplished because of you. Congratulations. Thank you very much, Henry. Thank you. Thank you. Professor Gordon. Mr. President. As the current president of the American Educational Research Association, I have been gifted with so many honors this year and so many opportunities um, to be honored, but nothing, no moment in this presidency has been a bigger honor for me than this one. At this time, I would like to read on behalf of the AERA Council, the proclamation um, and confer upon you formally the title of AERA Honorary President. The Council of the American Educational Research Association with acclaim and affection hereby issued the following proclamation on March 26, 2021. Whereas Dr. Edmund W. Gordon's contributions to education research and national education policies span more than seven decades, and whereas Dr. Gordon served as one of the primary architects of the nation's Head Start program and was influential in the development of the first elementary and secondary education act 
1965. And whereas Dr. Gordon championed a vision of supplementary education as a strategy to level the education playing field for underserved children of color. And whereas Dr. Gordon has played a leading role in advancing the association's work toward genuine inclusion, particularly for persons of color, as reflected in the work of the AERA Task Force on the Role and Future of Minorities. And whereas Dr. Gordon served as the organizer and chair of the Gordon Commission on the Future of Assessment and Education, which called for a national effort to transform assessment into a broad-based strategy for enabling America's diverse student population to learn to their fullest potential. Whereas Dr. Gordon has been a generous, compassionate, and caring mentor who has profoundly affected the lives and careers of scholars for decades. Therefore, with one voice and with one heart, on this 12th day of April, 2021, to commemorate and honor the exceptional and extraordinary contributions to education research, to the essentiality of valuing and supporting others, and to the advancing of science, human judgment, and human justice as integrally connected. The American Educational Research Association hereby officially accords the title of honorary president with all the attendant powers and prerogatives on Dr. Edmund W. Gordon. <laughs> Thank you, Sean. Thank you very much. Thank you, Manny. <laughs> folks, uh, Sean reminds me that in the long list of folk that Kenji was uh, thanking for helping me along the way, I get credit for a large number of uh, young, predominantly people of color that I have helped along the way. But as I reflect on this past, uh, certainly, 80, if not the, the entire uh, 100 of them, as I reflect on this time, I have learned <clears throat> so much, so much from Linda and Carol and Jim and Amy, and the list goes on and on of young people who came along after me, who I simply discharged what my daddy told me. And that was that if you got a little bit of privilege, you're supposed to share it. If you get inside the door, your job is to hold it open for somebody else. <laughs> That's what you'll continue to hear from me. Thank you, Ben. Thank you so very much. Congratulations, AERA Honorary President Edmund W. Gordon. Few of us in this life manage to achieve much without the assistance of other people. That's certainly been the case for me. My advice to you is to keep going. Keep at it as I have tried to do. Keep at it, but remember that you need some help. We tend to neglect our most powerful research instrument, the human mind. We will use the empirical evidence but we've got to think about it. We've got to use human judgment to interpret it. And those of us who want to be super scientists in the current period might well remember that the best of us in science use our heads in addition to our data. I was never quite able to win election as president of this August body but you have showered me with other awards and recognitions. But I am perhaps most grateful for the fact that the many ideas that were considered marginal to the values of the association when I first presented them are now at the very core of AERA's concerns. I thank you. I thank you for honoring me. I am embracing my ideas. 
Thank you very much. <laughs>